another minute. Right, okay. Uh, good evening, good evening, good evening. Right, we are um, going to talk about um, the Tfilot, which are connected with the Yamim Noraim, with the Days of Awe. Um, we are, this is our regular slot for our Tfilah Sheol, but for the next few weeks, we are going to stop what we were doing, which was in the middle of the Shema. Um, but we're actually uh, in between the paragraphs, so we're allowed to stop. Um, and we're going to uh, concentrate for the next few weeks on um, some highlights um, of the uh, Tfilot of the time of year. Those of you who've been uh, following the Tfilah Shir will know that we uh, like to go through things in great detail and uh, we don't make a, lot, a huge amount of progress in terms of uh, material covered, but hopefully by the end of it, we've got some kind of understanding of the Tfilah that we've been looking at. So we're going to start, since we are in Chodesh Elul, we're going to start with um, the tefillah that we started saying uh, on the uh, second day of Rosh Chodesh, i.e. the first of Elul, and we will carry on saying it all the way through until and including Hoshana Rabbah. Uh, and that is, of course, the prayer of the David Hashem Ori V'Yishi. Um, Psalm 27, actually. Uh, and it's uh, an interesting and beautiful psalm. Um, and we're going to have to ask a lot of questions about this. First of all, why do we say it now? Why do we say it in Chodesh Elul? Why do we say it all the way through till Hoshana Rabbah? Um, why do we only say it twice a day? We say it, if you're Nusuch Ashkenaz, you will say it, uh, after Shacharit, the end of Shacharit, and you will say at the end of Arvit, Marif. If you daven Nusach Sfarad, as we do here, you will say in, after Shacharit and after Mincha. So why the difference there? And why not say it every tefillah? Why only twice a day? Why not three times a day? Um, so there's lots of different questions to ask about uh, this prayer. But the first thing I think we probably should do is actually read it and see what the words mean. Because one of the things that we uh, try in, in this particular shiur to do is to understand the words rather than just uh, garble them off and not understand them. So let's have a look and see what it says. Uh, those of you who uh, have got a Sidor in front of you, um, you can, if you haven't, we can get you one. Hang on a second. Yeah, um, just pointing them out. Anybody who wants a cigar, find it for you in this uh, this one. What page it's on? Uh, in the Rinat Yisrael blue Siddur, you will find it on page 124. Okay, page 124 in the uh, blue Rinat Yisrael. Uh, let's have a look at the tefillah. It's Psalm 27, um, and it was written by... Who do you think wrote this? David. David wrote most of the Tehillim, not all of them, but David HaMelech wrote most of the uh, Tehillim Psalms. And this one has got his name at the beginning, mm -hmm. Le David. Now, when you when we talk about this prayer, this is for you, Frank. Um, when we talk about this prayer, we refer it to it as the David Hashem Ori. That's what we call it. And we shouldn't. We shouldn't. We shouldn't. Uh, Frank is very keen on us punctuating, and he's quite right, of course. He's very keen on us punctuating the tefillot correctly. Uh, for example, he uh, pointed out when we were talking about Kadosh, 
kadosh, kadosh, Hashem Tvao, which is not right. It should be kadosh, 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 Hashem Tvao. They go together. If you look carefully, uh, that's where the commas are. Um, and uh, we refer it re to notes are and and to right to right to where the notes are in the in the in the pasuk that's right and it's where the the punctuation is in the siddur. So here we refer it to it as the David Hashemori or the David. Well, the David doesn't really tell us much because there's quite a few till in the beginning of the word the David, but we know what we're talking about because it's the time of year. So let's just have a look and what and see what it means. Le David, a psalm of David or by David, okay? Before it, before it was... Le, Le David means to David, that's right, but it means by David, okay? Okay, so that's a good question. So Solly has asked, when did he actually write this? Let's go through it, and then we'll ask the question and see um, if we can answer that question by the context of what he's saying. Now, I want you to pay attention as we go through this, uh, the translation of this, I want you to pay attention to the way the mood of the psalm changes, uh, and I want you to see if you if you can uh, if you can pick up how uh, the mood of the uh, of the author is changing as we go through, because it's very unusual uh, in this particular psalm. So let's start. Le David. A psalm of David. Hashem ori v'yishi. Um, God is my or light. God is my light v'yishi. And my redemption, salvation. Um, just let, let Johnny in. Uh, so or is light. Yishi, my salvation. Same word as Yehoshua. Joshua, uh, same word as Yeshu, Jesus. Okay, it's the same root. Uh, God is my light and my salvation. Mimi ira. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? In other words, nobody. It's a rhetorical question. If Hashem is my light and Hashem is my salvation, I have nobody to fear. Who shall I fear, says David? It's a rhetorical question. He's feeling very, very bullish here. Hashem ma'oz chayai. Hashem is the strength. Oz, yeah, strength. Oz, Hashem oz liamo yitain. Okay, oz means strength. Hashem is the strength chayai of my life. Mimi efchad. Who, who should I fear? It's another word for fear. Pachad is dread uh, another another word for fear so um hashem is my strength the strength of my life who shall i fear who shall i be in dread of nobody so he's very confident here david at this part bikrov alai mereim when the reim what's the root of that word reim ra evil so when the evil doers reim are the evil doers when the evil doers karov Come close, ally, to me. When the evil doers approach me, lechol et basari, to eat my flesh. Okay, sarai v'ovayli, my sarai. What's tsar? Narrow. Tsar means narrow, but it also means from the Yiddish word tsoros. We all know that word, trouble. Sarai, those those who, who trouble me. Translated here in the art scroll as my tormentors. It's a good good expression. Torment my tormentors, the oivai, are my enemies, Lee, against me. Hema Kashlu Vanafalu. Hema, they will Kashlu. Li Kashel means to, to fail. It means to stumble. They will fall. Vanafalu, another word for falling. They will fall away. He's really confident here, David. David is saying, Hashem is my strength, Hashem is my light, Hashem is my salvation. I have nobody to fear. I am not afraid of anybody. My enemies, those that want to eat my flesh, they have no chance. They're all going to fail. Im tachaneh 
alai machane. What's that mean? Im tachane alai machane. What's a machane? A camp. And and that's right, a camp. But a camp of what? Usually, machane in this context, it's a camp of soldiers, an army. Im tachane alai machane. It's the same word, yeah? What's a tachana? A station, yeah? A station. The tachana merkazit is central bus station. So the tachane alai machane. If the camp will camp upon me. In other words, if the if there's a whole army, a whole army comes against me. Lo yira libi. My heart will not fear. He's in bullish form here at the moment. And he carries on. Im takum alai milchama. Milchama. If a war will takum arise upon me, if a war will come upon me, Bezot ani boteach. In this, I will trust boteach. What's bitachon? You see the guys walking around there with bitachon on their back? Security. Bitachon is security. Ani boteach. In this, I will trust. Okay, what, what is it that you will trust in? Hashem. Hashem, that's right. So that is the first three verses. Okay? And if I said to you, what is the overwhelming mood of the author in those first three? Confidence. Confidence, yeah? He's he's very confident. He, bullish, yeah. He knows that he's in a strong position. He's got Hashem on his side. He's absolutely confident that Hashem is going to uh, save him from all trouble and sorrow. Um, and he's in, he's in good form. So well, Teach is to trust, yes, yes. He's trusting in God. When you have that, when you have that complete trust, that's a feeling of oh, it's, it's a great feeling, right? If you're a, a, a little child, as a little child, and you're holding your daddy's hand, you know that nothing can, nothing can be any nothing can get go wrong here. You trust entirely. You're holding your daddy's hand. Everything is going to be fine. And that is how David is feeling in these first three psukim of this uh, of this psalm. He believes that he's holding God's hand. God hold, is holding his hand. Everything is going to be fine. Nobody, not his enemies, not his tormentors, not those that want to uh, rise up against him. Nobody can harm him. And now we see a slight change in the mood. Let's have a look. Achat sha'alti me'et Hashem. Achat. One thing. Sha'alti, I have asked me'et Hashem, from Hashem. I, one thing I've asked Hashem. Ota avakesh. That, that, or this, avakesh. What's avakesh? I've requested. What's the root of that word? Bavakasha. Bavakasha means please. Now, why does it mean please? B with bakasha with a request. So when you when you say please, that means I'm requesting of you, please. So the word bavakasha it means with uh, with a request. So one thing I ask of Hashem, that is all I ask. Only one thing I ask of Hashem. Shifti bavet Hashem kol yemei chayai. Shifti. What's the root of that word? La Shevet, to dwell or to sit, to be, to live. Shifty to sit or to dwell. Bebet Hashem in the house of God. Kol Yemei Chayai. That's all I ask. All I ask is to sit in the house of Hashem all my life. La Chazot. What's that mean? To look. Chose means to look. Chazon Yishayahu. Shabbat Chazon, the vision, uh, the, the Shabbat where we read the Chazon Yeshayahu, the vision of Isaiah. So to behold, to look at the Noam Hashem. Noam? Pleasantness. Noam means pleasant. What do you say when you meet somebody in English? How do you do? What do you say in Hebrew? Naim Ma'od, which means it's very pleasant. Means very pleasant to meet you. Nice to meet you. Okay, that's what it means. Nice to meet you. Uh, so that's all I'm asking, says David. 
So all I'm asking is to sit in the house of God all my life and to behold the pleasantness of Hashem, Ulavaker, and to visit, same word as Bikur Cholim, to visit the sick. Ulavaker Behechalo, to sit in his in his uh, sanctuary. Heichal. Heichal is the sanctuary. This is called the Heichal, the sanctuary, the shul here. So now he says, I'm only asking for one thing, and that is to sit in the house of God. His confidence seems to have waned a little bit. He's now requesting that he's he should be allowed to sit in the house of God all his life. Why is this happening? Why is this changing? Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna see it. Ch it changes further as well as we go along, and we're gonna ask that question, John. It's a good question, uh, and we're gonna come to it. But first of all, I wanted to just show you the change in, in the first three took in. He's bullish. I'm in in complete control here. God is with me a hundred percent. And now it's changed a little bit. He's now requesting. He's requesting. Okay. Okay. So so the there is, but but that that's when you're making a statement, very bullish. very bullish. Now it's less bullish. You're requesting. It's not otherwise, you know, when you're bullish, you say, I am dwelling in the house of God. I will dwell in the house of God all my life. That's all I'm going to do is dwell in the house of God all my life. I'm going to see. He's a, a bakesh. I'm seeking this. You'll see. You'll see. It fits in. Stay with me. So then what does he say? Ki yitzpaneni v'suko. He will yitzpaneni. What does that, what's that? What is, what is something called tzafon? Tzafon. What do we, where do you have that word? Go on. Safon means the north, yes. Safon, where do you have Safon? Very good, Peter. You have Safon on the Sedanite. What is Safon? The Afikoman. And what do you do with the Afikoman? You hide it. That's what Safon means. Safon means hidden. And why is the north called Safon? Because it's hidden. It's the furthest thing away. The north, you know, you say, oh, it's gone. You know, it's right up in the north, right? My kids live right up in the north, and my kids live like, you know, nine kilometers from Lebanon. Uh, uh, they're hidden away, all the way up there. Safon means hidden. He, um, and this is this is a future tense. This is, he will hide me. It's a request. It's part of this request. Part of this request that he says, I just one thing I want from Hashem. Just one thing I want. I want to be in his house so that he will shelter me, hide me in his sukkah. We'll come to we'll come to what that means in a uh, later on. When will he hide me in his sukkah? The yom ra'ah on a bad day. When the when the bad. Well, wait, hang on a minute. There aren't any bad days. He's he's meant to be bullish. You can see the mood has changed in this second part of the. Uh, of the tefillah, of the tehillah, of the of the psalm, he's gone from being bullish to being doubtful. Now he's asking for help. He's talking about a yom ra'a. We'll talk a little bit later what this bad evil day might be. Yastireni beseter ohalo. Yastireni. What's seter? Hide. Hide. Okay. If you say you do something beseter, it means you do something in a hidden way. Oh, we're going to see. We'll see. What what I want to do is to look at the translation and then look at David's life and see if we can see where this might have fitted in. Um, so he's now he's now asking. He's asked to be sheltered in the sukkah of Hashem on, a, on when an evil day will come. And he's now asking, he will conceal me, Yastireni, he will hide me, Beseter Ahalo, in the concealment of his tent. So he's now asking for God to hide him away. Previously, he was up there in front of his enemies saying, none of you can get me. You can come and try. You can come and try and eat my flesh. You can come and try and attack me. You have no chance. Now he's asking God, uh, please in the future, and there's going to be an evil day, I'm now avakesh, 
I'm seeking, I'm asking, Vavakasha, I need help to be hidden by God. Okay? When? Where? But Sur, upon a rock, Yoroma many, he will lift me up. What's that reference to? Well, when you're on a rock and you're lifted up, you're lifted up out of out of harm's way, right? So if you're in a if you're in a fortress on the top, why do they put fortresses on the top of hills? Because they're difficult for your enemies to get. So but sure your own many. Raise me up on a rock. In other words, out of oh, harm's yeah. way, out of reach of my enemies. He's not so confident anymore. He's not so confident. He's asking for, for all these helps. Ve'ata. And now, Yarum Roshi Aloivai Sevivotai. And now, meaning, now, when you've done all of that, when you have done all of that, when you have raised me on the rock, when you have concealed me in the tent, and when you have sheltered me in the sukkah, then, I, it says, Ata, now, it means, when all that's happened, Yarum Roshi Al Oivai Sevivotai. My head will be elevated, Yarum, Romumu, yeah, means to raise up. Um, same word as Ramat Hagolan, the Golan heights. Ramat Poleg means height. Yarum Roshi Al Oivai, my head will be elevated over my enemies, Sevivotai, who are around me. Okay, so, and then what? Then, and then, this is in, in the future, and then I will slaughter Ezbecha, Ezevach, I will bring an offering, in his tent, meaning, what's his tent, what we're referring to there, the Beta Mikdash, because this is where the sacrifice is, in God's tent, Zivchei Trua. What kind of uh, offerings will I bring then? A Trua. What's Trua? The sound of the shofar, the sound of the shofar. And what does the shofar bring? What did we? Where do we see in the in the Torah the shofar being used? First of all, at Matan Torah, but then there's a mitzvah to sound ah the yovel at the jubilee. And what happens at the jubilee? Everybody goes free. Everybody goes free. Slaves go free. Everybody becomes uh, um, a free man. This Zivchei Trua is a, um, he translates it here in Art Scroll as, um, I, will, I will sacrifice in his tent offerings accompanied by joyous song, which is not what Trua means, but, uh, but the implication there is it's a time of, of happiness. It's a time of salvation. It's a time of freedom. What do we say at Yovel? Um, they will call, and this is on the Liberty Bell. Shame we've got no Americans here. We've got Americans on the on Zoom though. Hannah's on Zoom. Um, the um, it says on the Liberty Bell, I will uh, call freedom throughout the land. Where does that come from? That's from the from the Torah, from the Yovel. The, uh, um, the Liberty Bell was correct. The Liberty Bell was correct. Yes. Um, so Trua is is a, is an indication of freedom of 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 uh, of salvation. Um, Ashira va'azamra ladonai, in the in the future tense, I will sing va'azamra, and I will another word for singing from Zmirot. Okay, Lashem to Hashem, Shema Hashem Koli Ekra, listen Hashem to my voice, Koli to my voice, Ekra when I call out, when I call out, listen to me. So what what do we what what are we calling out for here? What do we usually call out to, to Hashem? Two things we call for. Help, help and praise. Okay? Help and praise. Usually, in that order. We cry for help, and then when we get the help, we praise. Okay? Bear that in mind. Okay? V'chaneni, and show me chen, favor, grace, be gracious to me. It's part of the birchat kohanim, isn't it? V'chuneka, and he will show you grace. Or favor, the aneni with an ayin, and answer me, answer me. La anot means to answer. Lecha amar libi, to you, my heart has said, bakshu panai et panecha, my face, my presence has sought out your presence, Hashem. 
avakesh, and that's what I seek. Okay, so that's the middle section now. So that middle section is not quite as bullish as the first section, but nevertheless, it still got ends. That middle section ends with a confidence that he will uh, have the presence of Hashem. He's not so sure about it now, but he's asking for it. He's saying, "I want to. Uh, I, I want you to raise me up, raise me up out of the way of my enemies, and then I will bring sacrifices. I will sing." He's, this is all. Uh, um, um, yeah. So, so it, it's gone down a bit from that real bullish uh, start, but it's still confident. But now we start to um, we start to see that things are going downhill a bit now. Because look at the next bit. Al taster panecha mimeni. Do not taster, same word as we had before, do not conceal, do not hide your face from me. Now, there's something called hester panim, the hiding of the God's face. When the, the, uh, the rabbis refer to hester panim, it, it refer, refers to God Hiding his face from what is the absolute opposite of what we, the Kohenim, bless us with. What do the Kohenim bless us with? Yisa Hashem panav elecha. May Hashem lift up his face towards you, elecha, towards you. Ve'yasem lecha shalom, and to give you peace. So this idea of Hashem turning his face towards you. Yivarech Hashem v'yishmerecha. Ya Hashem panav elecha v'yichunecha. May Hashem cause his face to shine upon you. And to be gracious unto you. Yisa Hashem Panavelecha. Hashem should lift his face. It's all about Hashem's face being towards us. The opposite of that is called Hester Panim, the hiding of a God's face. Now, it's God is turned away from you. Don't want to know. Withdrawn his, withdrawn his, withdrawn his presence. presence. And this is those, those people who spoke about this terrible times in Jewish history, whether it be the Holocaust or the Crusades or Tachvetat or, or the pogroms or whatever it was. And Purim as well, yeah. It's the same word, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Esther is actually a Persian word, but um, mm. so same roots, uh, Samach Taf Resh, yeah. Um, of course, why is Esther called Esther? Because she hid her identity, she concealed her identity, that's why she was given the name Esther. So so Hester Panim is a terrible situation. We're told in the Torah, in the Tochacha, we will read it in this, in not this week, the week after. We will read it that God will turn his face away from you. God will hide his face from you and you'll have all those terrible things that will happen to you. And that is what happens when you have Hester Panim, when you have God's face is hidden from you. you it's the opposite of the bracha that the Kohenim give us. And uh, terrible things happen when you have Hester Panim. It, it, it's it's curses come as a result of God withdrawing his favor to us. And, you know, those of you who have been in a situation where, um, you know, you've had a row with your wife, God forbid. Right. What does she do? She gives you the cold shoulder. Mine does. Anyway, she you know, turns her face away. Don't want to know. Doesn't make any eye contact. I right. Do that for years. Yeah, it gives you the shtum powder for, you know, no. for, for five minutes max. Right, that's men. Men can hang, hang, men can do it for five minutes. Women can do it for for ages. They've got staying power, but that's what they do, isn't it? They turn their face away, and it's it's a horrible feeling because it, what it's saying is, it's saying I don't want a relationship with you. I do not want a relate right now. I'm not interested in you. I'm turning my face away. Avoid eye contact. Nothing. So here he's worried now. David is worried. He's saying to God, "Al tafter panecha mimeni." Don't, don't turn your face away from me. Where's the confidence gone that he had? It's, it's dis now it's, it's, it's dissip dissipated. Let's carry on. Al tat ba'af avdecha. Do not, tat means to, to push away. Do not push me away. Ba'af, af means anger. Okay, af is the nose. Ba'chara uh, af Hashem. Shem's nose, as it were, became angry. I mean, you know, you think of this, Fire coming out of you know the nostrils of the of the oh. of the dragon when he gets angry. Al tat ba'af avdecha. Don't push me away. Where in the anger avdecha against your servant. Well, wait a minute. A minute ago, 
It was Hashem is Oriva Yishi. Hashem is my best friend. Hashem is looking after me. He's my salvation. Now he's saying, don't get angry with me. I, I, don't, don't, don't hide your face away from me. Ezrati Hayita. Hayita. Meaning, what's Hayita? You were, past tense. Ezra. Help. Ezra. The word Ezra means help. Ezrati Hayita. You were my help. What do you mean you were my help? Should be Ezra Atta. You are my help. No, no. He's now in a situation now. He's thinking this is so great. Now you were my help. And now I'm worried you're, you're hiding your face from me. Um, what have I done? Uh, I'll, and it, it gets worse. I'll teach Shani. Do not desert me. Do not abandon me. Va'al ta'azveni. Do not leave me. La'azov means to leave. Where do we see that word? Very, we're going to say it very shortly. It's Fadim are already saying it. In Shema Koleinu of Slichot, yeah? Al ta'azveni. Yeah? Come on, Frank, how's it go? Al ta'azveni. Leit zigna. Al ta'azveni. Don't, don't, don't abandon me. Don't abandon me. So, this is now all very negative. Don't turn your face away from me. Don't be angry with me. You used to be my help. Don't abandon me. Don't forsake me. Elohai, Elohei Yishi, the God of my salvation. You're my salvation. Don't, don't do this to me. It's all very, it's all very negative here. Very different uh, way this Tehillah began. And then something really harsh. Ki avi v'imi azavuni. My father and my mother have abandoned me. I'm all alone. I'm all alone. My parents have abandoned me. A terrible state of affairs. You know, it's when you're a small child and you, you know, your parents are, are not here and you, you feel abandoned. It's terrible. Yes, yeah, you feel very unsupported. Vashem ya asfeni. Hashem, please, it's, it's, this is a part of this, this, this plea. Ya asfeni, gather me in from Le'esof to gather, gather me in. Hareni, Horeni, Hashem. What's the root of that word? Lahorot means to teach, yeah, to teach, yeah. What, a, what word do we know that comes from that root? More, a teacher. Horim, parents, they teach you. Or a, yes. A more, a more basic one. Try putting a taf in front of it. Torah. Torah. Same word. Teachings. What is the Torah? It's the teachings. Horeni Hashem. Teach me, God. Darkecha. Teach me your ways. What does that mean? Teach me your ways. Who said to Hashem, Teach me your ways. Show me your ways. Hareni na'et kvodecha, he said, this person. Show me your glory. Moshe, when did he say that? He said that at the time of praying for the people after the golden calf. And we're going to come to that's going to be the subject of next week's shiur. It's going to be that uh, idea of the 13 midot. Hashem, Hashem. When, when Moshe said to God, teach me your ways, teach me your glory, show me your glory. What did he mean? He, he, and what he meant, show me your ways, God. And God says, I can't show you my ways. You're a human being. But I'll tell you what, I'll put you in a, in a little rock on the side and I'll put my hand over you and I'll, and I'll walk by you. And this is the same idea where he, he spoke about the 13 attributes, Hashem, Hashem, Keil Rachum, Bechanum, which we're going to talk about next week. But this is, uh, the, David is saying, Horeni Hashem Darakecha, show me your ways. He's lost. His parents have, uh, have abandoned him. He's lost. He's struggling. He's on his own. He's unsupported. And he says, Hashem, gather me in. Hashem Yasfeni, show me your ways. Unecheni ba'orech mishor. Unecheni, lead me. Lead me. Ba'orech mishor. Ba'orach means in the, in the path. Mishor, straight, show me the right way to go. I'm lost. I'm abandoned here. My parents have abandoned me. I don't know where to go. You're a little child. 
you're you're lost. Huh? He's giving the the feeling of how he feels. The young man is now ending as a Well, that's how how often we feel, isn't it? We we when we're full of youthful vigor, you know. And maybe maybe this is you know we're going to come in a few minutes to discuss actually what's going on in David's life. Maybe this is part of it. Maybe the beginning of his life when he's a youngster. You know, how confident were we when we were youngsters? We knew it all, right? We knew it all. We thought we knew it all. And we were confident. Everything was, as you get older, you realize eh, it's not, eh, things are not quite so black and white as they seem. Doubt creeps in. And then at the end of your life, you realize, or towards the end of your life, when things you get a lot more experience in life, you realize that life is very, is very, on black and white, there is a very shades of grey, and you actually need a lot of help where you thought you knew it all and you could do it all on your own. You can't. You need to have guidance, and that is what's going on here. So he says here, show me the right way. Laman shorarai. Why do I need to be shown the right way here? Because of shorarai. What? What? How? Would you, how does Rabbi Sachs translate that, Frank? My oppressors. He says, my enemies here. Sure, arrive. So, again, he's talking about oppressors here. He's talking about enemies. I need your help. Gather me in. Show me the right way. This is no longer saying, my, what, what did we start with? I don't have any worries about this. They're going to fall away. They're going to fail. That's what we said a few minutes ago. Now he's pleading with God. Do not give. Do not give over. Do not deliver. Don't give me over to my enemies. He's pleading with God now. Where's all that confidence gone that, that these enemies are going to fall away and God is his salvation? He ain't so sure anymore. Ki kamu vi a day sheker. Ah, now we're getting a little bit of a, an idea of what's going on in David's life. Ki kamu, because there have arisen, come, lo kam be Yisrael, never arose in Yisrael, kamoshe navi, like a prophet, like Moshe, come. Ki kamuvi, they've arisen against me. Who's arisen against me? Eide sheker. What's an aid? A witness. And what's sheker? A liar. A false witness. People are accusing me falsely. People are accusing me falsely. Vifeach chamas. Vifeach. What's something? If something is napuach, what does that mean? Swollen. So it means it's. They are. They are. Blown up, they they are they are um um they're breathing, they're, they're they're full of air. What kind of air are they full of? Hamas. What's Hamas? Violence. Hamas is violence. Where do we see that in the Torah? Hamas. When where did we see that the world was full of Hamas? Yes, correct. And that's uh, the time of the Mabul. God said this place is. Full of Hamas. The world is full of Hamas violence. Um, and that was the end of that. So he says, there are rising against me. Who are rising against me? False witnesses and people breathing violence. People trying to kill me. People are trying to kill me. Lule hemanti lirot batuv Hashem b'eretz harim. Lule. What does lule mean? Would there be? Ah, oh, if only. Lule means if only. If only. Hemanti, if only Hemanti in the past tense. If only, what's the emuna? Emuna is, if only I had been faithful, if only I had believed, Lirot Batuv Hashem, that I would see the goodness of Hashem, the Eretz Chaim, in the land of the living. What's he saying? Oh, if only I would believe that I would see the goodness of Hashem in the land of the living. What's it mean? I, I'm about, they're all after me. They're all coming after me, these false witnesses, these people who are full of violence. I, if only I would live to see the goodness of God. He's in real trouble here. Kaveh el Hashem. 
Cave. Hope. Where's what's where do we know from that? Hatikva. The hope. Cave al Hashem. Hope to Hashem. Put your put your hope in Hashem. Chazak. Be strong. Vyamit and have courage. Libecha, may your heart, may your heart, your heart should have courage and strength. The Kaveh Hashem. And and hope in Hashem. And that's the end of the, the, the Tehillim. Now, we've got all sorts of questions to answer now. Uh, what in earth is going on in this prayer? We have said this for the last however many years we've been saying it. Every day, twice a day, for 40 days, more than 40 days, 47 days, right, of each year, twice a day, and none of us have ever looked at it properly, myself included, okay? So now we've got to look at it properly. We've got another 20 minutes to look at this properly. We've, we've understood the words now. We can see what David is going through. He starts off all confident, and eh, not so confident in the middle, and in the end, he's in real trouble. He's... he's yeah, he's 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 pleading. He's pleading. He's begging. He's begging Hashem for mercy in the end. So before already, Rosh Bani was running for Shaul and the story of Moh, you know, and the priest, and he was there. Okay, so Yochanan, several times it happened after he was at the top or after that. Yeah, I think it was Achitof. It was uh, Achimelech. Achimelech, yeah. So, okay. so um, and Yochanan is talking about some of the stories that we read in Tanakh of David's life. What's the first story we read of in Tanakh of David? Where do we meet David for the first time? With Goliath. The very first story we read in Sefer Shmuel Aleph about David is David and Goliath. That's his, that's his, yeah, he was a youth, we're told there, he was a na'ar, he was a youth, he was a young man, and what does he say? He said, the Goliath says, who's going to fight me? And who should have gone? Shaul should have gone, because he was the king, he was also the biggest guy around, we're told that Shaul was head and shoulders taller than anybody else, he didn't go. And who goes? This little schnip, this little David comes along, and he says, I'll go and fight him. And what does Shaul say? All right, here's my armor. And what does David say? Don't need that. Why? Because I trust in Hashem. Hashem, Hashem, and he says at that time, if you look in, in, in Shmuel Aleph, I think it's in chapter 14. I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong on that. Uh, but round about there. He says there, the, the God who saved me from the bear and the lion will save me from this monster Goliath, okay? I'm not, I don't need any of that rubbish, that stuff, right? That's the beginning of his life. That's him there. That's him. The David, Hashem Orivi Yishi. Me, me, Hira. Who am I afraid of? I'm not afraid of you, Goliath. Just because you're nine foot tall and you've got, you know, muscles coming out of your muscles. I'm not frightened of you because Hashem Orivi Yishi. This is the beginning of David's life. This, this is referring to David's life. And then what happens is he reaches the peak there of, of kills Goliath. He then goes out and massacres the, the Plishtin, 10,000 of them. Uh, and he's at the top of the tree, but not for long, because his father-in-law, King Saul, um, has his Mishagas. He goes his paranoid schizophrenia and he tries to kill him. And he has David has to run away. So he has to run away. And, and, and so what does he say? He says, I want to sit in the house of God. Where does he run away to? Where does David run away to? After the whole business with David and Jonathan, Jonathan says, you know, if you're not there, I'll shoot the arrow and you'll have to run away because my father's after you. No, that's before. He, he does go to a cave. You're right. But where does he go? Which place does he go to? You mentioned it before. He goes to a city of Nov. The priests were there. And what does he get there? What does Achimelech, the, the, the chief priest, I'm not sure he was the coin Gadol, but he was the chief priest of that city of priests. What does he give him? He asks for, David asks for two things. He asks for provisions and weapons. And Achimelech says, I've got no bread to give you. The only bread I've got is the Lechem Apanim. 
the showbread, okay, the holy bread. So that means where must they have been? They must have been a sug shell mishkan. They must have been in some kind of. There was a question where the mishkan was at this point. But if he's got the lechem upon him, they must have been in the mishkan. So what's the mishkan? The Beit Hashem. It's the house of Hashem. And what what is what did we call it before? We called it a heichal. He says he wants to sit. Uh, uh, where is it? Ulavaker beheichalo. I want to be in your sanctuary. What does the word sanctuary mean? What does it mean in English, the word sanctuary? Yes, secure. It's a place of refuge. And that, you know, if you go to, <coughs> this was a, a halakha, wasn't it? If you if you have somebody who's on the run and they go into the, into the, into the, into the temple and they hold on to the, the corners of the Mizbeach, right? Wherever, in all sorts of religions, right? You go into the temple, the temple is a place of refuge. That's why it's called a sanctuary, because people take sanctuary in there. So here, the second part of, of this is reflecting his um, reflecting his time when he's running away from Shaul. Yes, Frank, you look very, very cynical about this whole thing. But those first two or three pesukim are almost as if he's standing on a balcony, preaching out to everybody, and then he closes the doors, and this is what goes on in private. And that's the change of the mood. Okay, we're okay. all very else. You know, when we go outside, it's one thing, but what we say behind closed doors afterwards is different. Okay, let me say that for the recording because they won't record you on that. Yeah, okay. Well, hang on one sec, Solly. I'm going to come to that. I, I just want to repeat what Frank said because they, they won't have been picked up on the recording. Frank said that the the the, the first three talking where he's confident is almost as if he's speaking to an audience. He's speaking uh, outwardly. Whereas the next bit where he's a little bit doubtful about things, he's come back inside himself, as it were. Solly says that this is a reflection of maybe of an old man looking back. And I want to come back to that because let's go on to the third part. We've spoken about the first part. That's the story, David and, and, and Goliath. Um, the, the early part of his life, he was a young man, full of confidence. We can relate to that. You know, we were, uh, we, it's embarrassing when you look back now, isn't that what it is for me? And you know, when, I, when I was, well, I, the kind of nonsense that I thought and did, and I was so sure I was right when I was a, a youth. You know, it's a bit embarrassing, really, to think about it. So we push that to one side. Um, and so now we come to the third part. The third part is he's pleading for Hashem's help. Now, if we follow David's life, what happened then? David did not have an easy life. David ascends the throne. First of all, he is, has to deal with the whole uh, shuttle business. He's got the plishtim breathing down his neck the whole time. He's got his own son, Avshalom, trying to uh, um, usurp him. Um, he then ha sees his sons, Avshalom and, uh, and Shlomo, uh, fighting over his, over his throne before he's even dead. Um, and he wanted to build the house of Hashem himself. Hashem said, no, you're a man of war. You ain't doing it. Your son can do it, but you ain't doing it. Um, the end of his life, and I think this is, ref is is a reflection of maturity, of looking back, as, as Solly said, what he realizes is that actually there's only, he's not as confident as he was as a youth, uh, and, and he's, in, he's in trouble. We're all in trouble. And this is what, one of the reasons that we say this at the time that we're saying it, because we may think that we're in good shape. We may think that Hashem is my light. Hashem is my salvation, as we started this, this Tehillah with. I'm in good shape. I don't, you know, I don't need to worry too much about Yom Kippur. I don't need to worry too much about Tshuva. All is good. Hashem's on my side. And as you go through the month of Elul and you start to say the Slichot and you read, uh, and then you get to Rosh Hashanah and then you read some more Slichot, which as you go through Rosh Hashanah, 
um, through through the the Aseret, you made Shuva, you read all the things that you're meant to have done, and then of course you come to the Al Khaits and you realize I've done that one, and I've done that one, and I've probably done that one as well. Maybe I haven't done that one, but I've, you know, and you realize that you're not in such a great shape. And at the end of the day, all you can do then is to say, Al what do they say here? Uh Al Tazveni. Al Titneni Benefesh Tsorai. This is a, you're crying out to, to Hashem. So it's a reflection. This this um um Tehillah, this whole psalm, I see it. I mean, a lot of what I've said to you tonight is my own Torah, so you can feel completely free to rubbish it if you like. But I see this as a reflection of David reflecting back on his life, and I see it as the rabbis having chosen it. What They could have chosen anything to say. Uh, why didn't they choose Psalm 23, right? The big contrast between Psalm 23, you all know Psalm 23. Yeah, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yeah, we, we all know that one. We all have to chant that in, in school. That is complete faith in God all the way through. There's no doubts there in that whole, what does he say? Shift, he says, I'm going to call you Mechayai, I'm going to be Shafti Beves Hashem, call you Mechayai. I did sit in the house of God all my life. That Psalm is one of complete confidence in God. Why didn't the, the, the rabbis choose that? I think they chose this deliberately because you've got to know you're not as great as you think you are and you're not as smart as you think you are, in the words of Dean Friedman. Remember that? Yes, yes. Okay, so so that's another part of his life. He realized that he was he, he was in trouble because what did he do? He sinned with Bathsheba. He knew he'd sinned with Bathsheba. And when Natan the prophet comes and says to him, you know, he gives him the, the analogy of the man with the sheep and everything in, in, there in, in, in Shmuel Bet. Um, what does he say? Immediately he says, Khatati, I've sinned. And he knew he'd sinned. And he knew he'd sinned big time. And when you know you sinned big time, you know you're in trouble. So what he's saying is khatati, al khait. That's what he's saying. Al khait, I've done these terrible things. Okay, I think I think that whole story of Batsheva and Uri. I think, actually, you could use that one story as a microcosm of this Tehillah. Because you could say, when he took Bathsheba, he was confident. He says, I'm the king. She's a nice looking woman. I'll have her. Thank you very much. What are we going to do with her husband? Well, I'm a bit doubtful now. I don't know what to do. We'll send him to the front and get him killed. Uh, that's the middle bit, the doubt. I'm in trouble now. He wouldn't go. He sent her home. What did he do? He sent him home to Bathsheba so that he would be with Bathsheba, and then when she had a kid, they wouldn't know it was him, David, that had made her pregnant. But he wouldn't go. He said, no, I'm not going. How can I go back with my wife when my soldiers are at the front? Uri was, <laughs> Uriah was a good guy. And there, so now David's in doubt, doesn't know what to do. So that's the middle bit. And then he realizes, Uri sends him off to the, to the front. Not only is he guilty of, of taking another man's wife, He's then guilty of getting him killed. And so then he realized, Khatati, he says, I'm in trouble. So I think that one story, I've not thought of that until just now, but that one story, Yochanan, that you bring actually fits in with this. You could you could apply that one story to this whole Tila. I think that, the, and maybe the rabbis chose this to, to deliberately for this time of year to show us that though we may feel confident Events may well not may turn out that we're not as confident uh, or we shouldn't be as confident as we were to start with. Just a little bit. So that, that's that's my take on the uh, on uh, this uh, Tehillah and why we say it. Just a couple of uh, historical things uh, from it. It's a fairly recent addition to the to the Tefillah. When I say fairly recent, I'm talking about 17th century, uh, late 17th, early 18th century uh, is the first time we see this 
uh, um, brought this fila brought uh, in, um, and it's uh, the the earliest mention of the custom of not the tila. Obviously, the tehillim goes back to to David Amelech, uh, but the earliest mention of the custom of saying it this time of year is in a work called Sefer Shem Tov Katan by a Kabbalist called Rabbi Binyamin Bainish Cohen, published in 1706. Um, that seems to be the earliest mention, although there's a tradition that it came from the Baal Shem Tov, um, which was a little bit earlier than that. Um, but it's fairly late. In, in terms of tefillah, that's fairly late. If you look in the Siddur of Rav uh, Amram Gaon, which is from the earliest Siddur that we have from the 10th century, you won't find it, uh, as you won't find many of the prayers. But this is a fairly a fairly late edition. Now, uh, we mentioned we've got a few more minutes. Let's just do a little bit of uh, of um, sort of housework, if you like. Ashkenazim say it, Shacharit and Mariv. Nusach Spars, Ashkenazim, Udav and Nusach Spars say it, Shacharit and Mincha. Sparadim, who go according to the Benish Chai, which is mainly the Moroccans go against the, according to the Benish Chai, they say it. Sorry, I beg your pardon. The Iraqis go again. Yeah, if you the, the, the they according to the Benish Chai, you're meant to say it at every tefillah. Not only are you meant to say it every tefillah, you're meant to say it. Not meant to. It's a good thing to say at every tefillah, every day of the year, not just at this time. So um, there's all sorts of different minhagim. And in fact, if you look in the uh, various sparring that, that tell you uh, how to behave and what to do, they all say. Go according to the minag of your place, because there's so many different minhagim of, and the reason for that is because it's a fairly late edition, and so different communities adopted different ways of doing it. Why do we only say it twice a day or not three times a day? I have no idea, um, I have no idea. Uh, but I think if I had to make up an idea, I would say when is the time when we feel most vulnerable? It's at night time, uh, so that would be after Mariv. Uh, when do we feel the most hope and the most uh, um, sort of um, yeah hope for the for the for the future in the beginning of the day? The morning represents the future. Um, maybe it's, it's it's a guess. Uh, I don't know why we only say it twice a day. I looked to try and find. I couldn't find any explanations as to. Mariv is a time of of darkness. Is a time of reflection. Why? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, except the only way I would say that I could, to fit in with what I've just said is that at the end of Mincha is the beginning of the beginning of the night, if you like. Whereas we're saying Nusach Ashkenaz saying it when it's already dark and, it, and it's already night. I don't I couldn't find a, an answer as to why we only say it twice a day and not three. <laughs> Okay, so that's a good uh, good good suggestion. Frank says, is there a link between Tachanun, which of course is what do we say in Tachanun? Vayomer David El Gad, Star Li Maod. Vayomer David El Gad. David said to Gad. Gad was the pro prophet at the time. He was a, took over from Natan as the prophet of the time. He said to Gad, Tsar Li Maod. Tsar from the word Tsarot. I'm in big trouble. I'm in big trouble. Uh, it was a time of his life where he was in big trouble, and, and it could well be. And of course, what do we do for Tachnun? We haven't got to Tachnun in our tefillah shir, but we will do. What do we do for Vayoma David al Gad? We put our head down. Why do we put our head down? Because we're tired and we're having a little schloff? No, because we're, we're in trouble. What do you do if you're really in trouble? Oy vey. You put your head in your hand. Oy vey smear. Right? And that's Vayoma David al Gad, Sali Ma'od. So maybe. Frank's suggesting that this idea of saying at Mincha time is because it links into the idea of Tachanun. Maybe that's a nice idea. Okay, we're up. Time is up. That is La David Hashem. I didn't tell you, and I must tell you this before we go. One sec, Jonathan, sorry. Uh, what, another connection between this time of the year, the Midrash tells us, La David Hashem Ori. Hashem is my light. What does that refer to? Rosh Hashanah. Hashem Ori means Rosh Hashanah. Why does Ori mean Rosh Hashanah? When did Hashem say, Vayhi Or, let there be light? At the creation of the world. What does Rosh Hashanah represent? 
the, the, the creation of the world. God is the master of the world. We we say that Rosh Hashanah was the birthday of the world. It's a time when a God said by he or. So Hashem Ori refers to Rosh Hashanah. Hashem Yishi, Ori Yishi, God is my salvation. That refers to Yom Kippur, because on Yom Kippur, we are davening for salvation. We're davening that we end of it. We come and we say, you know, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, save us. Um, so Yishi refers to Yom Kippur. And Ki Yitzbaneni B'Sukkot, obviously, is a reference to Sukkot, which is why we don't stop saying it at Rosh Hashanah, uh, at Yom Kippur. We carry on saying it up to and including Hoshana Rabbah. We do not say it on Shmini Atzeret. Uh, where we, that's, we, no, that's we, we say it on Shmini Atzeret there because we're not sure what day it is or we really are. But don't get me started on second day Yom Tov. I haven't got time for that right now. Uh, uh, so we don't say it on Shmini Atzeret because Shmini Atzeret is not Sukkot. It's a separate Yom Tov altogether. So we stop saying it. So the, the connection uh, there is is that's a sort of scriptural connection, if you like. Ori refers to Rosh Hashanah. Yishi refers to uh, Yom Kippur and Yikiyitz Beneni B'Sukkot refers to Sukkot. Uh, but I think that we've done a little bit better than that. That's a really superficial sort of connection with it. What we've done tonight actually is to delve into this idea of the human nature that we start off confident in our lives. We start off at the beginning of Elul. Eh, I'm not such a terrible fellow. I'm okay. I'm okay. But as you approach nearer to the day of judgment, whether we're talking about the day of judgment being Yom Kippur or the ultimate day of judgment as you come to the end of your life, you realize actually at the end of the day, all you can do is say, Al uh, don't don't abandon me, Al Tazveni, don't abandon me. I need I need help. And that I think is the essence of the David Hashemori. I'll just ask if there's any questions in the room. Yes, Jonathan. I don't know. What's the timeline of that? How old was he? How long did he have? We don't know exactly when he wrote it. My feeling is he wrote it at the end of his life because I yeah. think it as Solly said I think it's a reflection of a mature person so I think he wrote this towards the end of his life that's that's my uh, view we don't know specifically when he was how, how many years did he live he lived 70 years oh, sorry. he lived 70 okay. years yeah yeah one question uh, he's finishing with Andrea Rashad which means the way he started should be finished with Okay, so Yohanan says he start, he finishes the way he starts. He finishes with Kavel Hashem. It's a, a you, it's a message of you should you know what what we, what do we do when we're older? We try and pass on our knowledge to the next generation, and that's what he's doing when he's saying that he's passing it on to his people. You know what, everybody, Kavel Hashem, Chazak Becha, be strong. But at the end of the day, just Kavel Hashem, just be hopeful of Hashem's salvation. And that's what that's what he's saying. Um, let me ask if there's any questions in the Zoom room. Any questions in the Zoom room before we go? No, jolly good. Okay, next week we will. Bezrat Hashem. Oh no, 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 not next week. Next week I have a wedding on Monday night, so there is not um, there is not going to be a shiur on uh, on tefillah on Monday night. I have to go to a wedding, um, and so the next shiur will be two weeks today. And Bezrat Hashem, we will deal with. The 13 attributes, Hashem Hashem, Kel Rachum Bechanon. Okay. Bye, everybody.